My name is Hitesh, and uh, as I mentioned, I'm not presenting, unfortunately. I'm just here to introduce our presenters uh, and just facilitate the, this, this uh, presentation as it goes on. Our first presenter is Jungo Khan from uh, KAIST. Uh, please take the floor. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, present our research in this event. Let me start by saying just a few words about myself. My name is Jung Khan, and I'm a PhD candidate at KAIST in Korea. I have conducted the related study for U.S. autonomy, especially uh, vehicle navigation in GPS-denied environment. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, coastal slam with marine radar for USB operation in GPS-restricted situation. I have divided this presentation into uh, four parts. First, I will introduce the background and the motivation of this study. Second, I explain the proposed algorithm for coastal navigation and mapping. To uh, verify the proposed algorithm in real coastal environment, two set of field experiments were conducted and their results are presented in the third part. Finally, I let up with the conclusion remarks. As you know, GPS is a primary and indispensable navigation device for vehicle navigation. Basically, GPS is uh, used for vehicle navigation by combining an inertial navigation system to acquire desired uh, accuracy. In more general situation, GPS system is utilized with another navigation device for safe navigation. For example, radar plotting, radar automatic radar plotting aid called ARPA and automatic identification called AIS are important devices for safe navigation in marine environment. Uh, these devices operate based on the GPS system to get their position information. Up to present, vessels are highly dependent on the GPS system for their safe navigation. However, GPS may not always be available even in open outdoor area. The GPS signal strength is weak when they arrive a GPS receiver, and thus they are very uh, susceptible to natural interference such as ionospheric anomaly and the intentional attack. Recently, uh, frequent and repeatedly uh, frequent, uh, frequently and repeatedly a GPS saving attack has been reported uh, with the development of the uh, low-cost GPS saving device. In particular, the malicious GPS saving attack by North Korea are an increasing problem in territorial coastal water in South, in South Korea. The North Korea has uh, repeatedly rep uh, reported the GPS saving signal near the, the northern limit line called NLL and their example has been report, uh, reported, and their examples are summarized in this table. As an alternative navigation system to GPS, the government of South Korea plans to deploy enhanced, uh, enhanced long range system called EROLAN system. But this system requires the construction of a huge infrastructure. Therefore, relative navigation and mapping is proposed in this study for peak navigation in GPS denied environment. Marine radar is one of the standard navigation device for surface ship, and this can be used for the relative navigation as a viable alternative to GPS. To be more specific, the relative position of the vehicle with respect to the static obstacles can be detected from radar measurement and they can be used as a landmark feature for vehicle navigation in marine environment. In particular, the surrounding coastline may be detected from radar measurement, and they are suitable landmark feature in marine environment. They are fixed in absolute coordinate, and thus the motion of the vehicle can be effectively estimate the position change with respect to the coastline. So, this study proposes a new approach for coastal navigation mapping with a USB using an onboard marine radar 
in the framework of simultaneous localization mapping. For coastline mapping, we proposed a parameterized map building approach using parametric curve, in other words, spline curve for memory efficient map management. For simplified map representation, conventional occupancy grid map based mapping can be utilized. However, such grid based mapping approach require to build a grid structure like this. So this approach require large memory space and uh, computational power to build a grid structure. Compared to the grid-based mapping approach, we propose the uh, parametric curve-based mapping approach. This approach uh, represented the coastline picture using contour line with a, a fraction of memory compared to the occupancy-based mapping approach. This figure describes the uh, overall procedure of the proposed algorithm. The first part of this uh, proposed method is to recognize the coast line from radar measurement. For this, a series of, uh, a series of image processing procedure is applied to radar measurement, and the obtained coast line pictures are parameterized using uh, this line. The piece line are described by a control point and their base function. So among them, Cost, uh, control points are incorporated into an extended Kalman uh, filter-based slam structure to estimate the vehicle position and the uh, cost line map parameter simultaneously. Let's explain the algorithm in detail. As I mentioned before, a set of image processing uh, technique is applied to extract the cost line from radar measurement to reduce the noise prevalent in ocean environment, morphological and the biological algorithm are applied to the radar image, and then the filtered image is converted to the binary image, considering the, the strength of each pixel. And then a detection algorithm is applied to obtain the a polygonal contour from the image, and then the the polygonal contour includes the coastline feature are obtained. However, non coastline features such as traffic ship and buoys may be also included in the extracted uh, polygonal contour. Compared to the non coastline feature, the obtained uh, polygonal contour, uh, which is included uh, real coastline, represents the over wider range because these signals are combined with the reflection from land masses. So the polygon whose area, the, whose area smaller than a predefined value are ignored. The obtained polygonal coastline contour uh, contain point, uh, point from not only coastline feature and borders of land masses. In order to extract only uh, the point, associated with the actual coast line, the pixel coordinate of the point on the contour line are transformed to the polar coordinate. And the azimuth angle is discretized by a predefined interval considering an angular resolution of radar. For azimuth angle, the nearest point in radial direction is selected as a coast line pitch point. The piece line uh, piecewise polynomial curve, and they uh, are represented with a control point and base function as shown in this math uh, mathematical equation. Given multiple uh, picture points, the set of the, the control point are obtained by fitting the picture point as shown in this formulation. Clamped knot vectors are applied and their size is determined the, considering the total length of the curve and the constant knot spacing. The control point of the surrounding coastline picture are registered in the ECAP-based uh, navigation filter structure to perform the relative navigation and map parameter estimation. A kinematic model 
in horizontal plane is applied to describe the planar motion of USB in such sway and u. The measurement equation of the relative position to the coastal line control point is described as in this equation. In order to estimate the vehicle motion state and the control point in the map parameter, the filter structure is augmented by cascading the vehicle state and the map state. The size of the, the filter structure increases with the number of the registered coastal line feature. To verify the proposed algorithm, a field experiment was conducted in real coastal area of South Korea. The USB system was equipped with FMCW radar, omnidirectional camera, and IMU, and AHRS, and GPS receiver. The first experiment was conducted in a narrow channel around Hoji <coughs> Island in the southern coast of South Korea using a Wembley system. So this uh, figure describes the, the experiment site of the first experiment. The, the width of the, this uh, channel is about uh, 450 meters. The second experiment was uh, conducted on a large, much, much larger scale in Asan Bay on the coastal of area of Western Sea of South Korea. So this uh, figure describes the experiment site. So the width of this structure is about uh, 11 kilometers. This video shows the result of the parameterized slam. Left video shows the result from the first experiment and the right video showed the uh, result from the second experiment. From the radar measurement, the coastline features are obtained and they are parameterized using this flying. And the control points are incorporated into the fil uh, slam filter structure and they are estimated with the vehicle position simultaneously. So the estimate the coastline feature are Uh, described by black scale, and uh, the trajectory by the proper, uh, proposed slam is described by in red line. This figure describes the, the comparison of the estimate trajectory. So in this figure, the trajectory estimated from the dead reckoning is described by blue dotted line, and uh, trajectory by the proposed slam is described by red line. And the ground truth data, the GPS data, is described by dotted line. The estimated control points in the filter structure are described by black scales. So when compare uh, the estimate position at the final position, the proposed method is more give a a uh, satisf uh, satisfactory result compared to the dead-reckoning based algorithm. And the uh, reconstructed coastline map are overlaid in the figure. So this result should uh, the reconstructed coastline map are well aligned with the actual satellite image. This figure shows the result of the, uh, the comparison of trajectory from the second field experiment. The legend is also the same as previous page, and in the uh, area of the final point, the trajectory estimated from the uh, coastal, uh, coastal slam is more give a uh, satisfactory result compared to the GPS data. And the reconstructed uh, supply map are overlaid on the satellite image in the right figure. So the map is well aligned with the 
real, uh, actual satellite image. Distance error of the two field experiments are described in this figure. The error is defined the distance between the GPS location and the position estimate. The distance error of the first experiment are described with the blue, uh, blue line for that reckoning and red line for the proposed method. And the distance error of the second field experiment are described with blue dotted line for that reckoning and the red dotted line for the proposed method. Compared to the distance error from the uh, dead reckoning, which is grows, uh, grows, uh, sharply grows in time, the distance error uh, from the proposed method is slowly grow, uh, slowly, uh, slowly grow compared to the dead reckoning result. The error can be reduced about uh, six times than that of the dead reckoning by using the radar measurement addition in this table. In this study, a new coastal SLAM algorithm is proposed for vehicle navigation in GPS restricted situation. An ECAP based SLAM filter is formulated to estimate the vehicle position and map parameters simultaneously. For efficient map management, the map features are parameterized using this plane. And uh, to verify the proposed method, two sets of the field experiments were conducted in real coastal environment using a KAIST USB system. And we found a reasonable, satisfactory SLAM performance. As a future work, the surrounding environment are going to model, uh, model it with, with, uh, more efficiently using additional geometric parameters, such as line and circles. Also, larger scale uh, experiments will be, con uh, will be conducted with long range radar to verify the proof algorithm for large scale SLAM. That's all my presentation. Thank you for your listening. Um, you mentioned a couple different uh, methods for doing the geometric representations of the coastlines. Did you look into um, any sort of uh, accuracy differences between those geometric representations? Uh, actually, we know that uh, actually we compared the SLAM result. Yeah. Uh, actually, we compared the SLAM result uh, uh, quantitatively by the, the GPS data, but we uh, compared the map the obtained coastline map uh, only uh, compared with uh, qualitatively. So uh, maybe it's, uh, it's maybe in the future we are compared to the in metric uh, distance between the real map and the SMS, uh, the reconstruction map, but the, the map is a change in time. So we can, uh, couldn't obtain the exact uh, satellite map when we are performed the experiment. So it was just some, um, it was, so hard to compare the, the in uh, quantitatively comparison. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, two questions: one for uh, potential use of Doppler velocity log to, uh, as a, as a sensor for speed measurement to be able to augment your filter uh, in addition to uh, IMU and uh, radar. And the second question about uh, the, uh, if you have clutter with other boats and ships, removal of that, uh, those features versus not static features, how much does that complicate the algorithm and uh, make it maybe uh, work difficult in, in, in real time or any future uh, maybe uh, you know, uh, plan to do some experiments? Yeah. Thank you for the... Uh uh, good question. So, 
In the first uh, question, uh, we can use the uh, Doppler velocity log to uh, use the, the velocity measurement in the filter state. But in our case, we uh, use the, the velocity uh, provided from the acceleration measurement from IEM sensor. So actually, we are targeting to use this algorithm not only not to the USB system, but also to the, the commercial ship. So in general, commercial ship does not have a DBL system. So we, uh, we did not use the DBL measurement in this, uh, in this, uh, in this experiment. So if we use the, the, the measurement from the DBL, um, DBL uh, sensor, the accuracy will be increased, and the, the error will be reduced. And in the second question, or uh, the ships or boats yeah. that are there, yeah, that's a good, that's a good better question. So, uh, in this case, we uh, have to separate the dynamic picture, such as a uh, traffic ship and something like that. So, we only the relative position of the vehicle with respect to the static obstacle, such as a coastline. But when there is uh, some uh, large ship. This uh, large ship can be detected from the radar measurement, as you mentioned. But the coastline picture uh, represents wide, wide area because this, uh, this coastline uh, reflection are combined with the reflection from land masses. So the polygon area is so big. So we can uh, easily uh, reduce the noise by comparing the, the polygon area. So. It's uh, our uh, the, the the easiest way to remove the, the dynamic picture in marine environment. And second, we can uh, use the the, uh, the if we available AES data can be used in this formulation. So when uh, and we can the the uh, AES device has uh, has to be equipped on the large ship because of regulation. So we have the, the, the trajectory of the large ship. So in this case, we know that the, the area which is located in the large ship, then we can, uh, we can put the area low, uh, high uncertainty in the filter state. So uh, we can, but if, we, uh, if the, the dynamic picture incorporated in the filter structure, the performance will decrease. But we adaptively uh, adjust the uncertainty of the control point we can uh, uh, we can uh, enhance the, the the algorithm from the dynamic picture. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? Could you, in real time, maybe compare uh, the estimates from your method and the GPS signals to check if there's spoofing or jamming of the GPS? The GPS the signal is not used in the uh, for vehicle navigation in the framework of SLAM. It's only used for the, the ground truth data. So, yeah, it's your question, right? No, no. no. Um, I know you're using it for ground truth compar uh, comparison, but could you basically detect if someone is jamming your GPS signal by doing your SLAM with the coastal navigation? Yes, yes. If, uh, Maybe there are the, some researchers have tried to develop the, the detect, detect the GPS jamming signal. Maybe the boundary of the, the, the register between the measurement and the estimated position. So uh, if, we, if we know the, the, the situation when the GPS jamming, uh, we, can, uh, we can use this algorithm. So in the case, the GPS position is, is uh, at first initialized is used as initialized position. So, and then we can estimate using the radar measurement. Any more? So, uh, using the radar, uh, usually uh, people adjust the good gain or pulse rate. So, how do you prepare for the experiment? Is that any adaptive controlling of the gain? Or? Yes, that's a good question. So in, uh, in uh, when using the marine, uh, marine radar, we have to consider the, the sea clutter and lake clutter and something like that for the, the, the noise and clutter in marine environment. So we can actually, at first, we reduce the, the noise from the gain control 
of the radar system, and then the from the, the uh, from the radar image after after gain control, but there is some left noise left. So in the case we uh, reduce the noise from the image processing, such as uh, morphological algorithm and pyrotechnic algorithm. So the noise is not uh, main uh, drawback in this uh, proposed method. Any more questions? Okay. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, so yes, I'm Peter, Peter Smith, um, and my presentation is on a simulator. Uh, I'll get into it. So. Uh, I'll be presenting on the project that I have been working on, the Autonomous Marine Surface Vessel Simulator. And I created this as my undergraduate thesis, and it was used in the 2016 RoboDex competition by the QUT team. So first of all, I'll talk about some of the motivations behind this. So we encountered a problem when we were testing in that it was difficult to match the schedules of our teammates, difficult to get permits, and it took a long time to get out to the testing facilities. When we did actually manage to get out there, we ran into more issues that we didn't actually have the props that were gonna be in the real competition, so it's hard to test our algorithms. So the solution to this was to create a simulator that we can test anytime, anywhere. So some of the key goals that I wanted to achieve for this simulator was to efficiently simulate the key sensors that were gonna be on the boat, including camera and LiDAR. Also, I wanted it to run efficiently and accurately on the development machines of our, uh, like our team. And to do this, I, I wanted to make sure that anyone could run it despite not having the greatest computer. And lastly, I wanted it to integrate with the robotic operating system, which is important for us as this is what all our algorithms run off. So I'll take a look at the sensors that I was simulating. First of all, we have the camera simulation, and we were using a 640 by 480 resolution camera running at 30 hertz. And one of the key goals here was to provide an accurate representation of the reflections of the water. And we did this because it's important for the vision algorithms, as sometimes it can be difficult for them to, to distinguish between an object and its reflection. Moving on to the LiDAR, the LiDAR that I wanted to simulate was a Velodyne HDL32. And the key point here is that there's 700,000 points per second. So it could easily become a bottleneck within the simulation and mean that we're not having real-time simulation. And the, lastly, one of the key requirements was to get GPS and IMU simulation. And I wanted to aim to simulate the effects of buoyancy and motor simulation on the vessel in the IMU and GPS readings. So now I'll take a look at existing simulators and why I opted to create my own instead of using an existing software. So first of all, I found UWSIM, and this is a good, it's a powerful simulator, but it's really designed for underwater vessels, and as such, lacks some of the key features. For example, the image simulation lacked any reflectivity simulation, the LiDAR simulation was non-existent because it doesn't work underwater, and the physics simulation didn't interact with the surface of the water in a realistic way. So next, moving to Gazebo, this one's more powerful, and it allowed image simulation, but to get the reflections, you needed third, uh, third party extensions for the Ogre library. Um, for LiDAR simulation, I only had ray trace depth test, um, which is accurate, but runs into the problem where it's a big uh, bottleneck in the performance, so it would slow down the simulation. And finally, for the physics simulation, it was there, but it didn't have any uh, interaction with buoyancy. And then finally, VREP was the, uh, the most capable for what I needed. However, it still lacked image simulation for reflections, and the physics simulation also didn't have any buoyancy. So these are the key points that I wanted to simulate and get to high fidelity levels. So I'll talk about how I went about creating my camera simulation. To make it efficient, I used hardware acceleration through OpenGL. And to render the water, you first start off with a water plane extending infinitely in all directions, facing upwards. And as you know, the realistic water is a combination of reflection and refraction. So to get these components, you have to imagine the world as a scene with a camera. 
to render the refraction component of the scene, you have to render everything underneath the water and store this in an off-screen texture. For the reflection component, you need an extra scene camera, which is situated underneath the water at a depth equal to the height above the water that your original camera is placed. With this new camera, you're able to render the scene, everything above the water surface, and store this into an off-screen texture called a reflection texture. Here, here's an example of a typical reflection texture and the refraction texture. So to combine these two textures, I used the Fresnel effect, which is the observation that the reflectance on a surface depends on the viewing angle. And applying the Fresnel effect to those two images, I got uh, an image that looked like this, an infinitely smooth plane, which as you can tell is not very realistic because whenever you look at water, it's ripply. So to introduce the real realistic rippling, I used what's called DUDV maps and normal maps. So first looking at the DUDV map, it's used to offset the index at which you uh, render the pixel for the reflection, giving it the distorted look. As for the normal map, it gives you a realistic specular lighting in that you get the, uh, the, the rippling effect with the lighting. So now looking at the image fidelity and a bit of a comparison. So I took some, a data set, which was uh, some testing of our WAMV at Gold Creek Dam, and I recreated the scene in both my simulator and in VREP. So as you can see, in my simulator, the, the effects of the reflection and refraction make a more realistic scene and you're able to get a higher fidelity image. All right, moving on to the LiDAR simulation. The primary goal here was efficiency, as we needed to output 700,000 points per second. And to do this, I used a method called Z-buffer indexing. So for Z-buffer indexing, you render the scene much like you do render the scene for a camera, but instead of storing the realistic images as RGB values, you instead store the depth as RGB values, where red is the most significant byte, green the next most significant, and blue the least significant byte. Um, while doing this LiDAR simulation, I ran into a number of limitations with OpenGL. The first of all was, in an ideal world, to get the 360 degree field of view, you just want one render to increase the performance. However, there's limitations with OpenGL, meaning that I had to do um, a horizontal field of view of 90 degrees and a vertical field of view with 60 degrees. Theoretically, it's possible to get a full 180 degree at maximum, but doing that distorts the image. So to get the least distortion, I use 90 degree field of view. The second limitation I ran into is in an ideal world, uh, to get the full LiDAR simulation, only, I only need 1,000 pixels across and 32 pixels in the horizontal direction. However, Due to limitations with OpenGL, I required a 16 by 9 aspect ratio in my rendering, which meant the true resolution of each of the four images ended up being 320 by 180, which meant that when I collected the readings that were important and discarded the rest, about 85% of the readings were discarded, which meant lower performance. So now looking at the fidelity comparison, I took the Gold Creek Dam Tower and I recreated it in a simple model in this simulation. And then on the right here, you can see the, the difference between the, the readings, where the red is the real world LiDAR readings and the blue is the simulated readings. Um, as you can see, it's, it's not quite perfect, but it's definitely high enough fidelity for the algorithms testing on our boat. So moving on to the buoyancy simulation. Uh, I used the JBullet physics library and one of the problems I had was JBullet also lacks the uh, representation of buoyancy at the water surface. So I implemented it as an extension to the library. To do this, I first created a simple physical representation of the boat, where the boat is represented as two cylinders, one for each pontoon, and a box shape, which is the payload. Once I have the cylinders, I then discretize these into a number of smaller cylinders, and for each smaller cylinder, I got the cross section, the circle, and determined the area of the circle that was underneath the water plane. Once I knew the area, I t multiplied that by the height of the cylinder to give a rough, a rough approximation of the amount of displaced water at that cylinder. 
combining all of the buoyancy forces from each of the cylinders, you get a fairly realistic model of the buoyancy at, on the whole pontoon. And to add the motor forces, I just added a simple force at the position of the motor. So one of the, um, one of the problems I had was the Gold Creek data set that I was using to test the fidelity of this model didn't have any motor information. So I was unable to test the, like how fidelity, how high fidelity the uh, physics simulation is. So moving on to performance. So one of the key goals here was to have a real-time simulation that worked on anyone's development machine. And as you can, um, this, this graph here shows the, the time it takes to render a frame in milliseconds. And to achieve the 30 hertz, uh, which is a requirement of real-time simulation, you need the frame render time to be less than 33 milliseconds. Um, as you can see here, my simulator was able to handle over 2,000 objects in a scene before the uh, performance got too slow to be a real-time simulation. Um, and looking at the next best simulator, VREP, uh, it was then unable to handle real-time simulation even at a low counts of objects. Um, now I'll provide a, a video demonstration of the simulator in action. So what I'm showing here are the, the buoyancy forces and the motor forces. Um, I have a, a water surface, which is um, just a sine wave in a given direction. Um, so I'm going to let the robot just drive through the course and I'm going to show you what kind of sensor output you get. So in the top right there, uh, sorry, on the, on the right here, you see the, the LiDAR information. Um, and in the middle here, you see the, the view of the camera on the front of the boat. So as you can see, the, uh, the LiDAR and, and the camera are able to update in real time. And it will publish these um, messages to the ROS to, to, the, to ROS topics so that our algorithms can read them in and uh, use them. So here I'm demonstrating that you can edit the scene, um, change values of props, like the, the scale and the rotation and position. You can add new props, and you're able to save um, scenes into a file and then load them up again later. So it's just an example of a, a simple scene um, that I was using for testing. Okay, so um, over here, I'm going to, uh, so I'm just looking at the different parameters that I can, I can set here. I'm going to move over to the, um, the water settings. So if you want to, the water looks different for different environments. And here, I'm going to change the water settings to what it looks like at Gold Creek Dam. So at Gold Creek Dam, it's pretty murky. It's not, not great water. So uh, just increase the murkiness. And you can increase the, the tiling, which represents the, the choppiness of the water. And you can um, change the reflection strength. And the water rotation is basically the wind direction. Um, that's what that simulates there. Yeah, that's um, an overview of the simulator. Um, so this is the second operation mode. If you, if you don't have your physics systems implemented, um, I implemented a simple click on the scene, and your boat will just drive um, in a very linear way. It's not realistic, but uh, it is, it's helpful for debugging algorithms, because you can just move to wherever you want, just point and click, and it moves there. All right, talking about um, future work of the simulator, so some of the factors that weren't modeled in the physics was wind and currents, and that caused dramatic differences to what actually happens in real life. So one of the problems the QT team had was uh, we developed using the simulator, uh, and that didn't account for the wind. And when the wind came into play in the final course, uh, you get different um, results. Uh, additionally, the simulator's fidelity of the buoyancy simulation was never benchmarked due to the lack of data. Um, and that would be something that we could use to improve the fidelity of the models. Uh, moving on to uh, the framework that I used. So I built it in ROS Indigo using Java, and I depended on a library called ROS Java. So this has made it hard for me to upgrade to the latest uh, recommended version of ROS, uh, just due to the dependence on the third party mm -hmm. ROS Java libraries. And I, I reckon it would be a benefit to, to do away with ROS Java and use a different method to pipe the images to 
and uh, LiDAR readings to ROS, making it easier to upgrade the simulator in the future. Uh, secondly, editing uh, the scenes was, was functional, but it wasn't the most user-friendly thing, so that could be improved in the future as well. So one of the ways I was thinking about um, improving this architecture was to use a framework called Unity. I'm currently using Unity for a different simulator, which is uh, an underwater robot. Um, and, and Unity has provided uh, high fidelity images, um, and it provides a very nice user interface to edit scenes, which is important for underwater scenes because they're much more complex. So uh, thanks for listening. Uh, if anyone has any questions. So sorry. you mentioned that uh, you're adding wind in the future work, basically, uh, wind effects. But I saw in the simulator there was something about wave um, frequency and wave height. So you already have that into account, or? Um, the, the current implementation of wind was only visual. It didn't add anything to the physics simulation at all. Um, and it, was, it, was, it wasn't much wind simulation. It was just the direction at which the ripples moved. Any more questions? Uh, yeah. Very impressive stuff. Um, I just had a couple of quick questions. Um, first, um, how did uh, image processing algorithms and perception algorithms actually transfer uh, from the simulation to real world? Um, yeah, that, that worked fine. So I developed the, uh, uh, when, when it was actually the competition, I developed the, um, the docking task and we were able to use the same, um, the same vision algorithms uh, in the simulator as, and they worked in the real world. We had to tweak the parameters um, in terms of the, so, so there were parameters, uh, we did colors based on RGB values, um, and they were slightly different in the uh, simulator, but um, you, just, you had uh, a setting for the simulator and the, the real world, and it's just a configuration file, swap around, and the, the, um, yeah, it, it did that. Thank you. Yeah, definitely a great job, man. It was really good work. Cheers. Um, so I noticed that you have the, the glare, right? It is accounted mm -hmm. for on the surface of the water. Does the glare also get imposed on the objects in the scene, such as buoys? Uh, so, uh, a little bit, but not, not as much. So there's, uh, in terms of lighting effects, I did add specular lighting to the, the buoys. Um, they, so they weren't very, they were there, they weren't very configurable, which is something um, Unity would be able to provide uh, more configuration on. Uh, so yeah, if you change the, the viewing angle of, of the boat, you'd see, you'd see different lighting effects on the buoys uh, based on the, the light position. Very nice job. Uh, I have a, one question that, uh, can you, uh, do you simulate the uh, sunlight? I mean, the sunlight? The, the direction? Not, uh, no, not direction, I, I mean, uh, the camera directly see the sun. Right. Be very much affected. Uh, not really, no, actually. Uh, so if, if the camera were looking at the sun uh, in the simulator, um, it would just, it, it, there's nothing special that goes on. There's, in the sky box, uh, in, in like the sky, there's a, there's a section that's uh, brighter, but it's not very, it's not super realistic. If, if I wanted to make it more realistic, when looking at the sun, it would just, it would change the, the, uh, the brightness of, uh, in that section. So, not really, uh, <laughs> essentially. Um, have you ever, um, <coughs> are you gonna put in uh, the, the swells. So for example, in tow tanks and whatnot, they have, in the North Atlantic, they use Pearson Moskowitz. It's a standard formula for swells. And what it does is it tells you the upset of the boat based on angle against incoming. So when, if you build a boat and you have a swell coming, you put so much energy in the end to these swells and you add and they subtract and so forth. And then you take the boat as an angle and it'll tell you how it's gonna react. And so you, it's a, a stability thing. Boat. But it looks to me like you're pretty close to being able to do something like that. But 
All right. Um, yeah. To, to be honest, I I didn't I don't know too much about the like the interaction of buoyancy and like boat models and something I'd, I'd need to research more but to make a higher fidelity model. I just I threw that in um, and just to to get something more realistic. Uh, so that that's definitely something that could be added. Yeah. Yeah, because the, that's really good for you know we have our boats out and whatnot, uh, and you could get high winds or something. You could put white caps and chunks in a slow and build up. And it's a really effective system. <laughs> There's also um, more visual effects that could be added. As you you might have noticed that when the boat was driving along, um, realistically you've got a kind of a wake uh, behind the boat, but that's not simulated in there. Um, uh, from my point of view, it didn't matter too much because there's no cameras looking at the wake. Uh, but if it was realistic, that would you know, play in parts in the, the physics model. And it would also, uh, if you had cameras, rear facing cameras, then it would also play a part. Um, but yeah. Does your simulation take into account the dynamically changing lighting conditions? Uh, not really. So uh, the the light itself um, was just a uh, point in the sky, and while it was running, you you can't. It, it's just fixed, um, but it would be easy to add um, the like, changing lights. Also, one of the things um, with with the framework I was using, there was a limitation that you could only have one light at a time, um, which uh, you, you could extend it, extend the framework. Uh, to, to add more lights would also be some future work. So, so you're doing any sort of calibration? That's what I'm trying to see. Oh, calibration. Um, so the, uh, not within the simulator itself. We, we ended up doing calibration to test the vision systems in the simulator against and see how the differences between the simulator and uh, real world. So in, in the real world, um, the images, the, the color was a bit more washed out than within the, the simulator. So when you have a, a red, target, the red plus sign, um, it was a pure red in the simulator, whereas in the, in the real world, it was, uh, it was not quite that. It had some color grading different, uh, had a bit of blue and green in there, and it's not quite, quite pure red. Um, and uh, again, the, the Unity framework allows for post-processing, uh, which allows you to add color grading effects to make it more realistic, which I think uh, using to, uh, moving to the Unity framework would help with the more realistic lighting effects, yeah. Any more questions? Okay, so you did mention how some of the tasks that you're gonna be tasked for 2018 RoboTax you can simulate and probably a lot of teams will also benefit from that there. Um, it seems that there's a great feedback that you're receiving here from the rest of the uh, <coughs> uh, teams. One thing about potential uh, simulating launch and recovery which is gonna be something that is probably gonna be the task for next year. And uh, do you think that you can speed up your development for a launch and recovery system for the AUV and uh, uh, mm -hmm. aerial using your simulator? Um, so you, are you talking about uh, launch and recovery like from the beach where you have to push it or like no, AUV? No, 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 surface vehicle launching and recovery oh, like autonomously like aerial and uh, underwater, under, uh, in right. wind conditions, sea state, and things like yes. that. Do you think your simulator can benefit the development uh, and accelerate? Yeah, so uh, I th actually thought, when I first uh, started the project, uh, it was my ambitious goal to include both above water and underwater, but then I realized I was gonna run out of time, so I just focused on the above water. Um, I was thinking, so for underwater vessels, um, I, th I think it would be good to be able to simulate them both at the same time uh, as uh, you, for, for algorithms, uh, for, for the algorithms in particular, you need to, the boat to be able to station keep while your underwater vessel uh, is doing its task because you don't want the boat to crash into uh, obstacles or, or drift too far and pull on the tether. So I think, yeah, it would, would definitely benefit from being able to simulate underwater as well and have them integrated uh, so you can do, uh, do more of a full system-wide um, testing of, of your, your platform. Yeah, I think so. So yeah, could definitely a lot more I could add to make it better. <laughs> Thank you. 
um, along with what Vladi said, um, what I thought was, okay, one of the challenges with lunch and recovery is the fact that you have multiple systems that have to work together. So let's say you know how uh, your USB is gonna station feed. Mm -hmm. Could you, with your simulator, feed real data from the USB and see it in real time? No, or maybe uh -huh. not in real time, as post-processing. Let's say I go out with the USB, I collect data that involves station keep in the USB, I give, you, I give you this data, and you plot it so you actually see the vehicle behave, but you're not actually plotting, you're actually feeding it into your simulator. Uh, yeah, so um, I think that comes into the integration with ROS, and so um, the simulator, uh, it, it fills in the, so when you're not, when you're not testing in the real world, you don't have that, uh, you don't have both the input from your cameras and, and sensors, and your output just goes nowhere. Your like, motor commands go nowhere. So the simulator is designed to fill in those gaps. And if you, if you say, have um, uh, data filling in some of those gaps, then it, this, the simulator should be able to fill in the rest of the gaps. Um, and I think, so there's, uh, there's not much in terms of configurability at the moment, but that's definitely something you could, um, as a, like a, that would be a fairly So you're gonna easy. continue to work on this? Uh, yeah, well, I hope to, I hope so. I think yeah, I'd like to move really it to Unity, it. yeah. <laughs> One last question. Uh, does your simulator uh, provide a real protocol data, I mean, from rider, look at, load it, like a format? Um, so it, it provides the same format you get in ROS. What it doesn't provide is it doesn't um, simulate data coming in from a USB device. Okay. So uh, for example, when, you're, when you plug in um, a, a LiDAR, uh, the Velodyne, uh, the Velodyne data comes through to a, a ROS node, which takes the raw data, converts it into a point cloud, which is published on ROS. So my simulator uh, publishes just the point cloud. It doesn't publish the raw data. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you for your time, Peter. Okay. Well, my name is David Thompson, and I'm here with Ember Riddle presenting uh, an efficient way to map LiDAR. And this was developed for the 2016 competition, but we are looking to expand this method into 2018 and beyond. So here's an overview of our platform, which we call Minion. And our ASB, uh, a lot of teams use uh, maybe a single LiDAR, or they, they don't use any LiDAR. Our boat actually has an array of four LiDAR positioned around the vehicle. Up front, we have a 32 beam and a two 16s, uh, port and starboard. And then on the rear of the ship, there is another uh, 16 beam LiDAR. And because we have so many uh, points coming in, it requires us to try and reduce that data as much as we can uh, for mapping and processing. Uh, but one of the first things we had to solve was we've got four LiDAR, and where do we put them on the boat? Uh, there's, there's plenty of spots to do it. In 2014, we just put the LiDAR, we had one LiDAR, and we put it right in the middle of the boat, basically as high as we were willing to mount it. And then for 2016, we decided to explore if there were better options. So we created a simulation environment that would render all of the LiDAR returns and then we could rapidly go through several iterations of position for the LiDAR around the boat and see what the result is. And over here on the left, you see uh, kind of a messy plot, but that's actually all four LiDAR um, being plotted on a flat plane. And the idea here is we wanted to make sure that you couldn't fit that small, that, that A3 buoy at competition anywhere within that black boundary and have it be missed. We want to make sure that at least one laser hits 
uh, the smallest buoys in competition uh, within the boundary there that we call our visibility horizon. So looking at the plot, we have all the red lines represent our uh, 32 beam. And then the blue and the green represent the port and starboard uh, 16 beam, while the pink is our rear velodyne. And then just on the right there is a close up of our positioning for the 32 beam and our two 16 beam lighter. Um, but ultimately, we settled on sacrificing some range in the rear and positioning most of our density towards the front of the, the vehicle uh, with the expectation that we won't spend a whole lot of time in reverse. Uh, so going over our software architecture for our platform, uh, over on the left you see all of the sensors that we have to interface with and then looking at some of the yellow colored modules, those are uh, sort of some of the processes we handle. So we take in our anemometer and our GPS INS solution to create a state, and that state basically feeds all of our other modules, including perception, which is there in green. And using our perception module, we actually feed the camera modules and path planning. So the idea is, is that our perception module will take in the LiDAR returns, and then from them we can create obstacles so, uh, for path planner to avoid, as well as creating classifications for the objects. But, as you know in competition, sometimes you can't figure out everything uh, just from the LiDAR. You need the camera to get color. So we actually um, will pull in the objects with the LiDAR and then extract a region of interest in the camera frame to get the color information from those objects. But that requires us to have a, an easy way to segment those objects and, and pass them around to the various modules. So zooming in on our perception module, we pull in the state. We get all those LiDAR returns um, in a local spherical coordinate system that that's just how the Velodyne handles it. But because we have four Velodynes, they all need to be rotated into the same frame. So the first step is we have to rotate those. Um, and then, like most LiDAR methods, we fit all of those points into an occupancy grid. Now, you'll see there's two lines that diverge, and that's because there are two separate occupancy grids. We have a three-dimensional occupancy grid and a two-dimensional occupancy grid. The 3D grid is used for object classification, so we can extract features from the, um, from the objects, like the object height or the surface area, while the 2D grid is more easily used for object segmentation because you can do your basic image processing on those. So taking a look at what we're actually doing today is all of our mapping and how we can accomplish that. But the issue is for competition, a lot of the objects, some of them may be too big to, to see uh, very accurately like the dock object. Um, or if, say, the first thing we discover at competition is the dock, we might not be able to act on it yet because we haven't completed another task that's dependent on that. So for the dock challenge, you have to complete scan the code before you can complete the dock. But if we already found the dock, we want to make sure that the boat remembers what it is and where it is so it can come back later. Uh, so by retaining those objects, we can enable that larger scale tasking. And uh, the problem is, is that our sensor range is limited. So again, that blue boundary there is our visibility horizon, roughly what we believe the LiDAR can see out to. And to accomplish this, we're going to simplify the objects that we extract down to polygons. So instead of just taking all the returns and mapping them uh, as large as we can, we're going to simplify those down to polygons so that when we leave the area, all that's retained are a few points and the object classification. Because for competition, that's all you need to know. You need to know the position and the class. So the first step in that is rotating those LiDAR returns. So as I mentioned before, when you've got multiple LiDAR, you need to rotate them into the same frame. And the LiDAR comes in in a spherical coordinate frame, so we rotate that to Cartesian. And then taking that local Cartesian frame, we rotate that into the <coughs> boat's FRD frame, which is our front right down uh, coordinate system, uh, located uh, basically in the middle of, of the boat. And then we transform that uh, FRD frame 
into a global NED frame so that we do not have to constantly keep rotating the map. We just rotate the points once and then we can traverse through the map. However, our returns don't always come in at the same time as a state estimate, so we interpolate the vehicle state to match the LIDAR returns. And then once we have our returned points, we fit them to an occupancy grid. And to the right here, you actually see uh, what one of our 2D occupancy grids looks like in simulation. So the first step, we fit them to that 3D 10 centimeter uh, grid size occupancy grid. That grid is really only used for classification. Uh, after that, we flatten it to a two-dimensional grid. So you just go through every plane of the 3D occupancy grid, and everything that's occupied just gets compressed down into one frame, basically a, an OR statement for every binary image. And then once you have this image, you can perform a, a polygon trace to extract your objects. But once that's done, sometimes the occupancy grid might have a little bit of noise in it, and uh, to further reduce those polygons, we use what's known as the Douglas Puker point reduction method, which simplifies the polygons down and removes some of those unnecessary points. So here's an example. On the left, you've got the occupancy grid, and on the right, we're showing the plot of that image with the objects extracted. So here we've effectively reduced all of our LiDAR returns down to a set of simple polygons. But as you'll notice, if we take what the occupancy grid provides and just labels all of those objects, you'd be left with multiple objects representing the dock rather than just a single object, uh, which is where our visibility horizon comes in to say the LiDAR cannot accurately uh, grab enough data from the objects outside this range. So we'll show here in a second that all of the objects within the visibility horizon are what's kept while we reject anything outside of that boundary. So here on the top is a scan I just showed, um, which we typically refer to as a current scan, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's the latest scan from the LiDAR. Because you've got four LiDAR coming in, uh, your current scan could be coming in at different times, and one pass of the LiDAR might not give you enough information for the object. So what we use is a temporal approach where every cell of the occupancy grid actually has an age. And after every iteration, that age decays. And if you find another point in that cell, the age goes back up. And if it hits zero, then it expires and the cell goes back to unoccupied. Um, and then using that, we can create that top image. And then down below, you have what a prior map would look like. So here you actually see a completed dock and some of the other objects, as well as an object outside the occupancy grid. Taking those, we're going to union the current scan with the prior map. So you'll see all the red points inside the visibility horizon are retained. Everything outside of that is rejected. And at the same time, we take every object from the previous map that's outside the visibility horizon is kept while anything inside the visibility horizon of the prior map is rejected. Using that, we can union and we get our final result, which shows that even though our current scan did not have an accurate representation of the dock, by merging everything within the visibility horizon to everything that was outside the visibility horizon, we can still retain uh, an accurate representation of that object. And then using that polygon, we can attribute a class to it. And now we have position and class for completing the competition um, successfully. So moving on to what it looks like in the real world, we did a pass of the shoreline uh, with mapping enabled. And that's basically on the left what it plots as. And then overlaying that on the satellite view, you can see how accurate it actually was. And once it's all said and done, you get roughly a 20 centimeter uncertainty on the points, which is very high accuracy for a global mapping approach. And what I'm going to show here is a video of the approach working in a simulation environment. So the top left frame is the simulation. 
uh, in 3D, and then the bottom left is our 3D uh, voxel occupancy grid. And then on the right, we're showing both the occupancy grid points as well as the objects that are extracted. So any of the purple lines are the polygons that are extracted from the white uh, velodyne returns. And you'll see that as objects pass outside the visibility horizon, they can stay in the map while their points may fade away. And here we're running basically what we thought the uh, obstacle course would look like from competition with the dot coming into view there on the bottom left. All right, so in conclusion, we're able to take all those LiDAR returns. Uh, with four LiDAR, you can easily get more than one million points every second that you have to process. We can simplify those down to uh, polygons and then retain class information with those polygons uh, for use later in the competition. And using that method, we can map our objects with a plus or minus 20 centimeter uh, accuracy. And not only that, this method is applicable to other platforms or LiDAR configurations. We've tried this same method on RoboBoat with uh, great success, and that had a single 16 beam LiDAR. The only issue, uh, major issue, is because we're using that temporal approach for objects inside the visibility horizon, where you have decaying time on your uh, voxels, moving objects will smear across the visibility horizon. And if you were to, say, rotate the boat such that that uh, smearing object left the visibility horizon, it would stay mapped as a smeared object. So looking into our future work, we're working to make this algorithm robust to moving objects so that we, we effectively filter out the temporal approach on motion. All right, so any questions then? With the Two questions. Uh, do you retain the entire occupancy grid, even though the occupancy values decay? Do you keep the whole grid for the entire operating area? Um, and having said that, what is your memory requirements and processing requirements to generate those um, occupancy grids? So the occupancy grid is a tunable value. You can set the size. Uh, in our case, the occupancy grid is an 80 by 80 meter um, by, I think, four meter tall uh, 3D space, and that just follows the boat. So as you move around, you know the occupancy grid is centered, or the boat is centered in that occupancy grid. So as objects leave, they are only polygons. We do not retain the, the 3D points for that. Um, and then as for memory requirements, you know you're dealing with an 8-bit uh, integer, and at 80 by 80 by four, you can do the math, but it's not very large. It's a few megabytes of memory storage for one uh, occupancy grid. Thanks, very nice presentation. So you mentioned you have this horizon and then you discard what, what's over. Couldn't you keep, if not the po polygons, of course, but just the positions, as a prediction of obstacles that you might have later, because you're basically this kind of information that might be needed later. So if you just know where they are and have that as a prediction for the next step, if you're moving on that direction, for instance, it can be useful. Uh, yeah, so you're saying instead of having a polygon, just reduce it all the way to a point and then just retain class? For, for the ones outside the... Yeah, for outside the visibility horizon. Uh, we could do something like that, but some objects, we want to retain that polygon information. So for the racquetball challenge, the detect and deliver, and the dock, uh, we further extract information for that. So on the dock, we use that polygon shape to find bays. And then on the racquetball, uh, the detect and deliver challenge, we use the, the lines generated from that to basically say where the faces are and where, 
we should move. So the path planner uh, will want that information. For some objects like the buoys, those could be reduced to a point. But for other objects like those, like the dock and the detect and deliver, it wouldn't be viable. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, so one thing I was actually thinking about was you said it's not very robust to dynamic objects. Um, could you use something like a belief space uh, representations of the objects themselves so that as you move away um, from actually being able to see them, you can think about where they're likely to be in the future? So that's something we've been considering is you know, basically creating a predicted state for every object that we detect. and. Um, that is something we're considering. Um, especially on the water, you get only a few different types of motion. So you might have a buoy, which has an anchored motion, so it's almost always like a sinusoidal motion, but it doesn't um, move through the space very much. Or you might have a boat where you know the, the motion's a little less predictable and you just create a vector for that uh, traveling. But that's something we're still looking into uh, how to implement. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, one thing that uh, you mentioned there, there was a future work about moving obstacles, and also there was something you said about uh, uh, interpolate states. But my question is about motion compensation, and I'm not clear if you're doing that because uh, ray, uh, LIDAR is rotating, so if you are slow, uh, moving slowly, you won't have really a problem, but if you're moving fast, then you have you see something, and then you know you basically have to turn your head back and to compensate for the you know fact that you move forward. Um, I don't know if you uh, are doing anything for motion compensation, and also if the accuracy of 20 centimeters would be improved if you are doing it. So the only compensation for motion that we're handling now is just the interpolation of the state. So right now our state estimate uh, from our INS system comes in at 100 hertz. And if you have any scan in between that state, we just interpolate where we've moved since then. And we can use that for each individual velodyne. But that's the only compensation we're currently using. My name's Troy Wilson. Um, I'm here from the Australian Centre for Field Robotics at the University of Sydney. Um, and uh, I well can't even remember my own title. So, uh, <laughs> um, present uh, some work on adaptive path planning for online modelling of non-stationary processes in the presence of um, basically sensor noise that moves uh, either spatially across the domain you're in or with time. Um, uh, done with my supervisor, Stephen Williams. Um, so the problem I wish to address in this paper um, is how, to, how an autonomous platform can simultaneously build a model, plan to improve that model of some scalar field um, in the presence of noise, which varies across space and time. Um, the motivating application for this was the modeling of surface salinity uh, across the salt freshwater interface of an incoming tide. Um, we can see up on the screen here um, a time lapse uh, taken earlier this year at uh, Lily Pilly Point, the Port Aking River, so sort of south, 30 k south of here. Um, we've got the tide coming in from the left, dense saline water, hits the lighter, fresh or brackish water in the estuary, um, goes underneath. Um, at that interface, we get a rotating turbulent core, um, which produces some turbulence. So if you're sensing the salinity as you go across this front, you're going to get a lot more um, variability in the, in the, in the readings um, or any, any other associated readings such as, as temperature. Um, so we need to account for this uh, when, we're, when we're doing the modeling. Um, polynomial chaos expansions applied to computational fluid dynamics experiments on density driven flows have shown this uh, sort of location dependent noise that exists across these density interfaces. So the, the contributions of this paper um, Basically, it extends some earlier work I did this year on, uh, on uh, parametric heteroscedastic Gaussian processes, which was presented at ICRA, um, and extends this to handle time-bearing noise uh, and also actually applying it to path planning. 
Uh, information measures for adaptive path planning under this model are analyzed. Uh, a parametric mean function is jointly estimated with the kernel parameters of the, of the Gaussian process. Uh, and all the analytical derivatives um, of the log marginal likelihoods with respect to the hyperparameters are derived, allowing efficient gradient uh, descent optimization of the hyperparameters. Um, so Gaussian processes provide a flexible framework for modeling. Uh, they're fully defined by a mean function and a covariance function and the observed training data. The hyperparameters of the model can be learned in a principled way from the data. Um, here is the, is the standard uh, uh, model for Gaussian process regression where the observed um, data points and the predicted points are jointly normally distributed. Um, there's a couple of elements I wish to highlight about this. Um, Basically, we have a mean function here, which a lot of the time people basically just assume is zero, um, and sometimes without even mentioning this is the case. Um, and this uh, noise term R, which in your standard Gaussian process is just assumed to be constant across the space. Um, the other point to note is that in the uh, prediction um, of the observed values and the uncertainty around those, both these values come in. Um, but especially the, this noise term. Um, if you're not taking account of this heteroscedastic noise, your predicted uncertainty it can be way off uh, across the space. Uh, through the paper, uh, I've used a squared standard squared exponential kernel. Um, the parameters of this are basically your length scale down the bottom here, which determines how far observed points have predictive power across the, across the input space, um, and a signal variance here which basically determines as you move away from your observed points how, how quickly your uncertainty grows. So um, as I said, the standard Gaussian process assumes noise is evenly distributed across the input space or homoscedastic. Um, the counterpoint to that uh, with input dependent noise, uh, I didn't come up with the term, but it's called heteroscedastic noise. They're widely used in econometrics, for instance, the uh, autoregressive conditional heteroscedasticity or ARCH models. Um, if you want to bring it back to something people here care a bit more from the engineering and ecological literatures, um, we have spatial abundance of MOS mites, benthic macroalgals, biomass, camera sensor noise, solar cell irradiation, and more applicable to this, this paper, um, water quality and salinity data. Um, so in that standard, uh, standard model, we basically have this R term is just a, a, is just a a scalar variable applied to an identity matrix that's added to the diagonal of the covariance. Um, so instead, under the parametric model, we're basically saying let's have an, analy an analytical representation of this noise across the input space, um, which has both this constant noise plus a noise um, which is basically uh, has a parametric model. Um, so for our case um, of looking at a tidal salinity flow, um, basically where we expect there to be higher noise across the, across the, the actual interface of the salt and fresh water. We're using a, uh, a Gaussian uh, weighted distribution across the front, um, which is centered on a polynomial function. Um, and this polynomial function is, is uh, a drifting function uh, and a curve to sort of show where the, where the middle of the front is. Um, so as I said, uh, often uh, within the Gaussian process, the mean function just assumed to be zero. Uh, and this is fine if you've got lots of data, um, you don't really, you can generally interpolate between the points that you have and the mean function doesn't have much, much impact. Um, but there are, there are a number of reasons why it, it can be important to use this if you, can, if you have any information to impose some sort of structure on the mean function. Um, so uh, using the knowledge that as we cross this salinity interface, we expect the salinity to be higher downstream than it is uh, as we cross the freshwater, uh, we propose using a logistic function to model this salinity. Um, and uh, we can see, I'll, I'll go through now in a simple sort of one-dimensional example, the impact that this can have on the, on the model. So on the left here, we have just a standard Gaussian process with a couple of data points um, uh, with a zero mean function. Uh, in the middle here, we have uh, the residuals after the logistic mean function has been taken out. Um, and, oh sorry, these, these data points are uh, simulated straight from the logistic function just with noise evenly across the space. And on the right-hand side, we have, we have a Gaussian process which has the logistic mean function in it. Um, we can see even with a couple of data points, uh, ha once we actually have this mean function in here, we, we can do pretty well. But we'll see what happens as we start adding more data points. 
Um, so basically we can see that <laughs> eventually the, uh, the zero mean function does start to fit the, fit the points pretty well. Um, however, it's only really doing this well closer to the observed points. And basically what's happening here is that length scale that the kernel is learning is very short because the points that are observed up here can't really be used to predict across the front to the other side. Um, if we take this mean function out, we're essentially fitting a GP on these residuals. Um, and so what happens there is that now the points all across the input space can be used sort of to predict each other. And so we learn a much longer length scale. Um, the other point to note is obviously as we go away from the observed points in the zero mean GP, the predictive value drops back down to that zero mean uh, and the uncertainty blows out very quickly. Um, whereas in, in the mean function with a, sorry, in the gassing process with a mean function, we learn a much longer length scale. Um, it's not reverting back down to zero and that longer length scale is allowing it to be much more confident even away from predicted data points. Um, so just sort of having a look at what, what the, the two GP models look like, um, we can see that on the, on the top, the standard Gaussian process um, has evenly predicted noise across the space um, and the predicted sample paths have sort of a constant variability throughout the input space. Whereas in, a, in the parametric heteroskedastic Gaussian process model, um, we have a much bigger uncertainty in the, in the middle of the space here um, where, the, where the noise is centered uh, and, a, and a sample path that varies more in that center than it does off to the sides. Um, so this is sort of the simulated distribution that uh, the model is tested on. Basically, um, if you look at it, if you look at the model in the, um, from the side, uh, we have a salinity um, level that drops as we go across the interface um, with higher variability in the in the observed samples, um, and this interface itself is slowly moving upstream, um, defined by a, a, a polynomial curve. So um, two information measures, entropy and mutual information, are uh, compared to the evaluation of active path planning under this model, um, in addition to randomly chosen paths, uh, where x are the observed points, x star are potential paths. Um, under mutual information, these, this x bar is the points that we wish to predict over, and this x plus is basically uh, a combination of the points we have seen uh, and the the union of the points we have seen and the points we wish to predict over in that instance. Um, on a simple one-dimensional example with a, with a stationary front, here we can see some of the key features um, that these two information measures uh, exhibit under this uh, parametric heteroscedastic Gaussian process model. So maximizing entropy, um, which can be shown by the, uh, the dotted blue line, basically chooses in the middle here, which is where we are most uncertain uh, about the front. However, maximizing uh, mutual information, uh, the, the function itself is, is, is basically entropy to start with, but it removes um, this second term, uh, which is indicated by the purple line here, which uh, is basically saying um, <laughs> what's the information from the points that we haven't yet seen that we're, that we're interested in. Not um, so the interesting thing in here, I in when this is applied to the parametric gas, parametric heteroscedastic Gaussian process model is um, that basically this takes out a lot of the impact um, of this uh, parametric, uh, parametric noise in the middle here, which becomes an issue because as we'll see um, as we start adding data points. So basically the, the mutual information um, is, the, is the solid blue line, which is the difference between uh, the two dotted lines. Uh, it's, on a, it's on a different scale. So as we start adding data points, basically we can see that under entropy, it's only ever basically the maximum staying in the middle. And so if you're trying to sample based on maximizing entropy, all you're ever going to do is sample in the middle here. Um, and that's going to leave you with a pretty poor sampling across the whole space. You're not going to necessarily um, very well estimate the salinity up and downstream. And if you've got an incorrect estimate of where the center is, you might be sampling totally the wrong space. Um, whereas a mutual information based measure Essentially what it ends up doing, as we'll see in a, in a, in a more complex example, uh, it samples relatively widely over the space. However, it does better than just random um, and, and uh, also does slightly more sampling in the middle than across the space. 
So um, to evaluate these measures for adaptive path planning, we've got to generate some paths somehow. Um, we decided to use random walks, uh, which provide a computationally efficient way uh, to generate paths which are probabilistically complete. Um, at each uh, planning horizon, 100 paths are generated um, via a random walk for a given horizon, as can be seen by the squiggly gray lines here. Um, so, uh, and these paths can be evaluated as a batch under each of the information measures. measures. So initially we drive the ASV across the front just to gather a few points um, to, to optimize the model to start with. And then basically under each planning metric, whether it be entropy, mutual information, or randomly choosing one of the paths that that path is followed, the model is, um, the hyperparameters of the model are re-optimized from the data collected, it's refit and it's repeated. Um, and that's done until the, uh, the mission time is completed. Um, just briefly uh, on the impact of actually including the mean function uh, in the Gaussian process as, as, as opposed to just using a zero mean. Um, we can see that including it uh, basically, uh, which is the, is the blue line, results in uh, much lower errors in both the root mean square error, um, which is the predicted errors in, in the actual salinity itself, and the root mean square standard deviation error, which is basically the same as the root mean square error, but uh, calculating the predicted errors in the actual standard deviation or the second moment of the distribution. Interestingly, the actual optimization time is also lower for including the, the mean function, which might be a little bit counterintuitive to start with because you're including more parameters. However, because the mean function and the covariance function share some parameters uh, in terms of the location of the front itself, um, this allows you to use information from both the signal and the noise that you're collecting to locate that front and it, it actually significantly increases the optimization time. Um, so any other, because of that and computational time restraints on running simulations, the rest of the simulations were only done using the, using the mean function as it provided much more accurate and timely results. So uh, what we're gonna look at now is, a, is an example of, of one individual path run through time. Um, the charts on the top show entropy and mutual information um, with a contour plot of the predicted standard deviation. Um, the gray line is the location of the front, which will start moving across the screen, and the black line is the path that's actually followed. Um, the bottom plots are the same plots as the top one. However, the, the location uh, stream-wise is shown relative to the front. So this front won't move here and um, everything's just adjusted as a distance relative to the front. So you can actually see, see how things are going there. So let's have a look at what's going on here. Um, so uh, the paths are sort of exploring around a little bit. Um, both entropy and mutual information seem to be taking a reasonable amount of space around the place. Um, but in a couple of seconds, so now both basically both models have sort of picked up some prediction that's reasonably good of where the front is, which you can see by the estimated slightly higher noise around the front. But you can see that entropy is now basically focusing all of its, uh, all of its planning on going back and forth along the actual front. Um, and if you look at this top plot, yeah, it looks like it's covering the space reasonably well, but if we actually look at the space relative to the front itself, it's really not sampling very widely. Um, whereas the mutual information based planning is covering the whole space relatively well with slightly more density around the front itself, which ends up leading to, to better results. So um, here we can see some statistics over 50 simulations um, with random entropy and mutual information driven sampling for a planning horizon of 20 seconds. Um, and it shows that mutual information outperforms um, on, on the predictions of both the, the uh, the first and second moment of the distribution. Um, uh, interestingly as well, it, as well as sort of having a better prediction, the standard deviation across the 50 simulations um, it is a lot more stable. And an interesting point, bit to point out is, is these spikes we see here and here um, for the, mu the uh, entropy driven sampling. And basically what happened there is that on some of the individual runs, it was just getting a really bad estimate of the hyperparameters because it just hadn't sampled widely enough and it didn't have enough information to optimize properly. And then it got a new data point and just jumped crazily. Um, and so it, it's a lot more unstable. And obviously this standard deviation is, is, is obviously very important if we're gonna try and run this in the field because you might only get one shot at it or it's expensive to run multiple experiments. So you wanna make sure that 
this mean result that you think you're going to get is the one that happens in the field. So to summarise the, the contributions, um, in parametric heteroscedastic Gaussian process has been extended to handle time varying noise. The problem of adaptive path planning uh, under this model has been examined and mutual information is shown to be a superior metric compared to entropy or, or random, random planning. Um, the use of mean functions in Gaussian process has been analysed showing both increases in predictive accuracy in the first and second moments of the distribution as well as in this case with shared parameters between the mean and the covariance kernel, uh, improved hyperparameter optimization time. Uh, and in the paper itself, uh, the analytical derivatives um, of the log li marginal likelihood with respect to the hyperparameters are, are all derived, um, allowing fast gradient descent solvers to, uh, to optimize these, uh, which is important if you're going to try and do any hyperparameter optimization online, uh, as iteratively querying a GP to obtain numerical gradients um, is just, it's just not feasible, it's too slow. So um, as future work, obviously I'd like to get this out in the field and go and get it on that salinity front that I showed you guys, which is near my house. Um, <laughs> it's getting it out in the field for significant amounts of time uh, might require some additional computational methods to stop the covariance matrix of the GP blowing up uh, and getting too large, um, such as probably inducing points. Uh, incorporating other sensor modalities could also be interesting to give more information on related measures to the salinity, such as the current itself or the water temperature. They might have slightly different noise characteristics, but, but be related. Um, and this moth methodology could be extended to, to other domains for the creation of um, different parametric noise functions. And uh, that's all, thank you. Questions? Everyone's asleep. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk through a little bit just on how you're actually calculating the mutual entropy uh, across the space um, for doing the path planning? The mutual information. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, to, to calculate the mutual information, you do need to discretize the space because you need to know um, at each point have you already been there um, because, I forget, can I get this up again? It's not touch screen. Uh, Um, so, obviously this bit's simple, that's just your standard entropy calculation. Um, this term here, basically you need to um, work out uh, the entropy of the potential path you're going to look at um, and instead of, instead of using the, the points that you have actually s um, sampled um, in the covariance matrix, you use all the... Whoops, Use all the points that you haven't yet sampled that you're the, all the points you haven't yet sampled that you're interested in sampling at, um, but you basically need to discretize that into a, into a grid because obviously if you've got continuous paths going everywhere, they, they could be anywhere. Um, and I also in this uh, in this method with the moving front um, to that still blows out uh, once you add a time dimension, becomes a, becomes three dimensional. So I also did that relative to the position of the actual front, rather than just rather than in space and time. So just sort of in a in in in, in that same space that was in the bottom chart in the, in the past below. Um, mutual information is more expensive to calculate than, than entropy because you have to calculate it for for every potential bit. But it's you can still get it to run pretty fast. Thank you. Any more questions? All right. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. So I think uh, that concludes our presentation. Thank you for your time.